Hello, everyone. I'm Lori Baskin. I am a Director of Research, Policy, and Collective Action at Theater Communications Group. Um, I know that we'll see all your faces shortly, but for the moment, welcome to this education post-conference. I'm so delighted that you're all here. Um, and I'm going to start us off um, and, then, and then turn it over to some colleagues. Um, but I just want to um, acknowledge that uh, this is a different day than we had originally planned. Um, we had hoped to be together in Phoenix, of course, um, but perhaps this is better and more accessible for many of you. We didn't have to travel, and, um, and so I'm glad that we could all be together today. Thank you all for joining us. I would like to note the dual crises that we're all facing together the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on all of our theaters and on our education programs and on every walk of life in this country and around the globe. I'd also like to note the pain being endured by our black colleagues and colleagues of color and the protests that have swept the country and the world against the violence and murder of black Americans and people of color. This landscape will definitely inform our conversations today. Before we begin, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the native land where we, where we are, all of us across the country. This is meant to be a moment of recognition and respect and to broaden awareness of the history of this land and as a beginning step in showing our commitment to repairing relationships with native communities. We also want to acknowledge and uplift that some Native folks have pointed out that land acknowledgements have often become an empty and performative gesture by white people and institutions. We recognize that this is by no means, nor should it be the end of our solidarity and support of Native communities, and nor does it in any way make up for the theft, colonization, and forced removal of Native land <clears throat> and the communities and communities perpetrated by this country. I'm going to share that um, I am working remotely and have been, as I am sure you all are. Uh, I work from home in uh, northern Westchester near Peekskill, New York. I'm currently on the lands of the Lenape and Wappinger people. Uh, we've, uh, I am going to right now put a link in the chat and I'm going to ask you all to introduce yourselves. We're up to almost 40 people on the call so far. I want to take some time for you to, for you to enter into the chat, not the Q&A, but the chat. I guess we don't have a Q&A. That would be if we were doing a webinar. In the chat, please put your name, the theater that you are affiliated with, and please also use this link to look up, if you don't know, the name of the land that you occupy in your home, your part of the country, enter all three things now in the Zoom group chat so that everyone, and make sure it's set so that everyone can see it, please share and we'll see uh, what the community, what kind of community we have and where we represent uh, and, and then we'll begin. So let's go ahead. And I am pausing if you're new to the call while everyone enters in the Zoom chat their name, their theater, and the, the land that they are, the native land they are occupying. And it's fascinating to watch. So we're just taking a pause to do that for a moment. We will, by the way, 
have access to the chat after the call and uh, we are taking notes and we'll share the chat and the notes down the line as well as the recording of this call and again this this call I don't think I said that this this meeting these meetings today are being recorded so that education colleagues from around the country who are not able to be here live and in person can uh, participate and and experience the conversation um, the breakouts when we do go to breakouts will not be recorded just what happens in the main room um, please continue to enter your introductions into the chat if you haven't finished please continue um, I would like to share some group agreements that we've developed at TCG uh, that I think would be helpful if we all keep in mind as we travel through this day. I want us to acknowledge that we're a group of, or we will be at some points in the day, right now we're 42 people, but we could get up to 70 or so, depending on people's schedules and coming and going. So please make space and take space. If you're a person who doesn't often speak up, please do join in. Um, if you're a person who tends to get very engaged and want to speak a lot, step back a little bit sometimes and, and make room for others to speak up. No one knows everything. Everyone knows something. And together, we know a lot. Allow everyone, please, to speak for themselves and not on behalf of a group. Acknowledge the difference between intent and impact. We can have the best of intentions and still something for the land poorly. And acknowledge the difference. Agree to disagree, but please do not disengage. What's learned here leaves here. What's said here stays here. And I'll acknowledge that because it's being recorded, it actually is going to leave here a little bit. But uh, as you carry the information forward, uh, be gentle or uh, um, mindful as you attribute things that you've learned here. Please respect the agenda for the day, but hold it lightly and look for moments of joy. The agenda is actually on the TCG microsite, uh, but we're going to move now into our first session. Um, it is the role of education in equity, diversity, and inclusion and culturally responsive pedagogy, and it's being led by Kati Kerner, Education Director at Lincoln Center Theater Company, and Nikki Toombs, Director of Education at Kenny Leon's True Colors Theater Company. I'm so grateful. Ah, oh, I mean, I, before I actually do that, I would like to acknowledge the planning committee. Could we please share the slide so that we can all see all the folks who really helped make this day possible. And I want to acknowledge them all now at the top of the day. Corby Adams, Director of Education and School Programs at Child's Play. Pamela De Pasquale from uh, Education Director at Cleveland Playhouse. Kati Kerner, Education Director at Lincoln Center Theater. Johami Morales, Education Director at Seattle Children's Theater, and she's a TCG board member. Nancy Schaefer, Dallas Children's Theater, Education Director. Nikki Toombs, Director of Education at Kenny Leon's True Colors Theater Company. And Jenny Toutant, Education Director at Milwaukee Repertory Theater. Thanks to all of them. They've been working with me for months. We started talking about this being a live in-person event. Then we started talking about it being a virtual event. Uh, and then we really wanted to acknowledge uh, the need to um, change the content a bit or more than a bit um, to uh, to address what we're all what's front of mind what's going on in the country today with that i am turning it to kati and nikki and thank you and i think we could probably yep perfect um i also before i, I turn it over i just want to acknowledge i have a few um tcg colleagues on the line um amelia smart denson wave please um, Amelia has been an a intern, actually, in our conference department, just graduated college, made the pivot from being an in-person intern to a virtual intern and stayed with us and helped plan the conference that took place in May and June and now this day, which is wonderful. Sam Morial, are you on the line? There you are. Wave. Thanks to Sam as well. And uh, 
all the support that Sam has uh, given to the conference department and to this day, I'm very grateful. I don't think that Anne Charlone is on the call now. No, okay, so it's the three of us. It is wonderful to see you all. This is so cool. Thank you for being here. Kati and Nikki, over to you. All right. Good afternoon. As previously stated, my name is Nikki Toombs, and I serve as Director of Education for Kenny Leon's Two Colors Theater Company in Atlanta, Georgia, under the artistic direction of Jamil Jude. And my co-presenter is Kati Corner, and she is the Education Director, I'm sorry, at the Lincoln Center Theater. And so we are excited and elated to come to you guys today to present the first session, which talks about the role of equity, diversity, and inclusion, as well as cultural responsive teaching. Um, when we talk about pedagogy as a whole, the art and skill of teaching and talking about teachers and students and their interaction between each other, this also includes the uh, approaches that are used when it comes to instructing, when we go into the classrooms or when we bring to prepare our curriculum guides or have students come to see our performances. When we discuss EDI work as a whole, it almost seems as if cultural responsive teaching is a byproduct um, of that. And so there's a conversation about the need to shift to reshape how we approach instruction when we're going into these instructional settings, as well as when we're bringing students to us as well. So I'm reminded quickly of, um, there's a gentleman, his name, he, they call him Mr. Jeff Des. Um, his name is Jeffrey uh, DeSource, and he, um, he does all of these speeches and TED Talks about cultural responsive teaching. And if you have not heard of him, he is a dynamic, dynamic, dynamic talent. And he talked about the shift when there was a need to reshape or revisit how we um, instructed students in the classroom. And he talked about 1993. And he said that in 1993, that was the year where the, the model was created for us to reshape and reform and talk about our instructional practices when we move forward. But when he mentioned 1993, he also talked about there were a lot of great great things that happened in 1993, specifically um, Macy's and, and Blockbuster, and said that these institutions and organizations were big things that did things a certain way, and they were the model or the prototype for the way things were supposed to be. But the problem is that they did not address or shift or reshift their thinking, and they kind of got left behind, which is an interesting fact because that's what happens sometimes with the students that we're dealing with. They're getting left behind because instructors, as well as art educators, are not willing to adjust and shift, and then we're having those getting left behind. He also mentions one of his um, great influences. He goes back to Harriet Tubman. He talks about a quote that she said when she said, I grew up a neglected weed, ignorant of liberty and having no experiences. I'll say it again. It says, I grew up a neglected, a neglected, excuse me, weed, ignorant of liberty and having no experiences. And we're having students in our classrooms and in our city that we're inviting, that we're inviting in that are feeling as if they are neglect, neglected. So in this conversation, we want to have a, a candid, raw, but kind conversation about some of the approaches that we can take. One of the resources that we'll provide for you all at the end before we move forward, we talk about um, Christopher um, Emden. He has a book um, called For White Folks Who Teach in the Hood. I don't know if you guys have ever heard or read that. Um, that's one of his book as well. And he talks about when he was um, a teenager, one of, his, one of the, his most memorable moments of instruction is when he um, read Ntozaki Shengi's For Color Girls Who Thought Out commit, Committing Suicide When the Rainbow Is Enough. But other than looking at the cover of the book, what, what was so impressive to him is when he saw the word enough, E-N-U-F. And so in his mind, he said the idea that somebody else wrote something in this public sphere that talked like I did, that used the same colloquialisms as I did, that was something that meant something to him. He felt as if he was preparing to have a, can't, to, 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 to be a part of a a book that was deep and moved the barriers of what the conventions say is appropriate. So what I'm hoping that in this session, we talk about that enough is enough, if we get, if we get our play on words. So what we're going to do as an activating strategy um, first, we're going to ask you a few questions. If you guys have a piece of paper by you and a pen, you're just going to write yes as largely as you can on one side and no on the other. If you don't, we'll just do a simple gesture of a nod for yes and a nod for no. I'll give you a 
few seconds to gather your paper as we get our ask our questions. I'll give it about 10 more seconds. All righty, here we go. So what's going to happen is I'm going to ask you approximately six questions and your simple response is yes or no. We'll take a few seconds in between the questions just to kind of scan and push our arrows on the room and gallery view and see what the, resp what the responses are from our colleagues. All right, here we go. With your residency model partnerships or after school programs, Instruction includes the integration of multiple social, social media platforms. I'll say that again, my apologies. With your res residency model partnerships or after school programs, instruction includes the integration or use of multiple social media platforms. Instagram, Facebook, any of those things. We'll give it a few seconds to see. All right, we'll move to question number two. When working with a new group, do you open a workshop or engagement with the acknowledgement of gender pronouns? Okay, we'll move to number three. During your warmups, is there use of music from multiple cultures? All right, we'll move to four. If you have a production that's, that does not culturally speak to the invited audience, do you provide resources to schools, instructors, or partners that parallel the theme of the presentation? Again, if you have a production that does not culturally speak to the invited audience, do you provide resources to schools, instructors, or partners that parallel the theme of the presentation? Next, do you use the argo or colloquialisms associated with a specific group when addressing students? Do you use the argo or colloquialisms associated with a specific group when addressing students? And the last question, are your teaching artists trained on religious backgrounds of various groups? Are your teaching artists trained on religious backgrounds of various groups? All right. So one of the reasons why we wanted to make sure that we ask some of these questions, because sometimes what, where there's a level of apprehension is because we're like, oh my gosh, I, I don't rap, I don't do this, I don't do that. And we don't want you to think that you have to reinvent the wheel. We just want you to understand that there are multiple ways to steer it. Some of you may recognize that some of the things that, that cultural responsive teaching utilizes, you already have set in place. So the hope with this process is that we'll be able to provide additional insight to see, hey, that you're already doing it and see how you can extend it or revisit your practices and make sure that you need to incorporate it. Kati? You know, even after all these hours on Zoom, I can still manage to not forget to unmute myself. Um, so uh, before we, um, just a sort of overview of, of how we envision the rest of this time to go. Um, we wanted to, um, now that we've situated ourselves and where we are in this work a little bit um, with Nikki, we wanted to go through some definition of terms um, and show you a short video about uh, culturally responsive pedagogy. We think that, um, there are so many different ideas about what this is and how these practices play out in our work, but we thought it was important to um, arrive at, at some kind of a common vocabulary and common understanding before we start to um, think about how it plays out in our, in our work. So, um, so we're gonna have a little bit of just definition of terms and then we're gonna break, talk about them in uh, breakout rooms, then come back and brainstorm some strategies um, and talk about how we might implement them. 
um, if there's time, we'll go into breakout rooms again and then um, talk about some resources and next steps. So I'm gonna share my screen just to go through a couple of, um, of these definitions. All right, so, um, so, you know, this, the, role, the name of the session is the role of education in equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we thought it would be helpful to start there with what is equity. So equity is the fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement for all people, while at the same time striving to identify and eliminate barriers that have prevented the full participation of some groups. What is diversity? Diversity includes all, and of course, these are not the definitive descriptions. You may have uh, alternate or additional descriptions that help to under, enhance the, the complexity of these concepts. Diversity includes all the ways in which people differ, encompassing the different characteristics that make one individual or group different from another. And it's often used uh, in reference to race, but it can, it can include all the very many different ways that we are unique and the different identities that we bring to our bring to the table. And of course, we know that, um, that all of these identities are intersectional and that adds to um, the, our complexity of understanding and the way that we uh, try and respond. So what is inclusion? Um, inclusion is the act of creating environments in which any individual or group can be and feel welcomed, respected, supported, and valued to enhance their full participation. So it really is about that full, making sure that everybody can fully participate with their full selves. So um, what is culturally relevant pedagogy? So uh, Gloria Ladson Billings, who's one of the, um, has written extensively on this and uh, is one of sort of the, the chief um, sort of, uh, I guess theorists. Um, she is a uh, works in the area of um, education and teacher instruction. Defines it as a form of teaching that calls for engaging learners whose experiences and cultures are traditionally excluded from mainstream settings. So it's grounded in three goals. You have to. Uh, it has to yield academic success. It has to help students develop positive ethnic and cultural identities while also helping them to achieve academically and support students' ability to recognize, understand, and critique social inequality. So it's a critical lens, as well as a overall strategy. Culturally responsive teaching, so the practice of culturally responsive pedagogy. Um, this is a quote from somebody we'll hear from in the video in a minute. Um, uh, an approach that emphasizes using the cultural knowledge, prior experiences, frames of reference, and performance styles of ethnically diverse students to make learning encounters more relevant to and effective for them. So if as teachers, we are constantly solving the, um, if I taught it, you must have learned it problem, um, culturally uh, responsive teaching is really about um, making sure that, uh, that learning is really happening. Culturally sustaining pedagogy. So there's been sort of this evolution of terms and some of the stuff is used interchangeably. And I think that there are find distinctions and it's important to recognize them. Um, so culturally sustaining educators help um, students develop a positive cultural identity. Django Paris is one of the sort of uh, people who's written extensively on this. And, um, and they say that culturally sustaining practice has as its explicit goal, supporting multilingualism, multiculturalism in practice and perspective for students and teachers. So what does this look like? Um, some of the ways is obviously not an exhaustive list uh, that this is put into practice includes student centered asset based instructional strategies, hands on project based learning integration of students cultural references and all aspects of learning. Um, but the but as we'll hear in the video that we're about to see um, culture is a is a term that is tricky and subtle um, and bears some some uh, thoughtful consideration modeling inclusive practices in social learning. Um, just, uh, we wanted to also, uh, I'm sure that everybody has seen the, the or many of you have seen the, um, the images that will follow, but, but we thought it was important to make the distinction that everybody understands the distinction between equity and equality as we launch into our discussion. So equality being everybody gets the same thing, in this case, the same box, 
equity being everybody gets what they need in order to um, have the same outcome, be able, in this case, be able to see the, the ball game. Um, obviously, reality <laughs> is, um, is all too often that uh, some people get everything and other people stand in the hole and are, you know, the metaphorical and are, are, don't even have what they, they don't, they don't have what they need um, to get anywhere near um, the, uh, the, what, what amounts to equality. Um, and of course, liberation is that there's no fence. So, you know, when we're, when we're parsing the boxes and the fences, liberation is that there's no fence. All right, so this is, this is, there's a lot of writing here um, and uh, I don't wanna go through everything, but just a um, way that you can incorporate cultural responsive techniques um, are you know, getting to know your students, establishing high expectations, integrating artifacts, investing uh, in identifying uh, cultural experts, um, using a, a multicultural curriculum, hearing everyone's story, collaborative strategies, pushing back, identifying what the dominant ideology is and then pushing back against it. And, uh, oh, sorry, now we've gotten, gotten too far. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then we're going to uh, watch a, a, oops, sorry. This is where it gets tricky, stop share. Um, we're going to look at a video and hear from some of the people who, uh, who work on these issues. So Sam, this is our TCG folks, this is where, <laughs> this is where we say help. <laughs> it's a, it's a four, about a four and a half minute video. I think people, when they use the term culturally responsive or culturally relevant pedagogy, forget that the base of the word is culture. So culture has to do with worldviews, beliefs, language. It has to do with values. Culture to me at its essence are the things that, um, those filters that help us as, as human beings make sense out of the most ordinary things culture can be grouped into two different kind of categories. You can talk about visible culture and invisible culture, or tangible and intangible. The tangible, I would translate that to say the crafts, the music, the art, the technology. And those are important, but I think the more important are the uh, intangible. And these are values, beliefs, uh, feelings, opinions, perspectives, assumptions. So culturally relevant pedagogy, one of the primary premises is that teachers take students' everyday lived cultural experiences and make the appropriate linkages between what the students know and do and understand and come up with examples, comparisons and contrasts. They make the connections, they are cultural translators, they are cultural bridge builders. I think when we talk about culturally responsive pedagogy, we have to remember that students approach learning not as cultural blank slates. So they bring into the classroom all of those cultural experiences. And so it is very compatible with what we know about good teaching. Culturally responsive pedagogy builds on students' prior knowledge. And in this case, we're talking about prior cultural knowledge, making connections between what is known and what is to be taught and understood. So part of the argument of cultural responsive teaching is the dilemma has been an incompatibility between the cultural filters that have been used to send instructional messages to students that's coming from the school frame of reference and when kids from different ethnic backgrounds are trying to learn that, they are trying to receive what we send from school through another set of cultural filters. And if they don't match, then nothing's happening. So cultural responsive teaching then says is that rather than always insisting that the students adapt to the culture of the school, the school needs to adapt and modify some of its sending messages, its sending mechanism. 
When we think about what matters most about culture, I think the first thing to remember is that students are not mere representatives of a cultural or ethnic group. And first and foremost, there are individual students who have individual needs and interests, etc. Students who belong to an ethnic group, their attachment and bonds to the group vary, for example, in terms of how long they've been in this country, uh, social class, and their own experiences in the community and neighborhood. Because if we think about students' culture, we make culture a trait of that individual based on his or her membership in a particular community, conflating race and ethnicity with culture. We don't take race off the table at all, but we're really pulling apart what culture is and making sure we don't conflate it, because if we do, then we make cultural practices uh, a trait of that person's membership in that particular community. And that leads us, of course, to make very e easily slip into one size fits all that my Latino children learn this way, or my African American children need X, right? And so it's making culture a trait of the individual that's been very problematic in the implementation of culturally relevant pedagogy. Great, thank you so much for your help. Okay. So um, what we wanted to do was to uh, go into breakout rooms. You will be in groups of five and you will have about 15 minutes to um, one, to respond to the video and the slides. What are your thoughts? What comes up for you uh, in, when thinking about these terms? And then two, uh, to talk briefly about how culturally responsive pedagogy is showing up or not showing up in your practice and why you think that is. So one, responding, just sort of what's, what are your thoughts, what's come up? And two, how is it showing up or not showing up in your practice? And it could be that it's something you don't know about enough about yet, or I mean, it could be a million different reasons. And then we'll come back and um, I would like to ask each group to deputize one person to briefly sum up the discussion, um, just to get a sense of, of what's, what those discussions uh, were like and what came up. And, um, and then we will meet back here in, uh, in 15 minutes. So um, Sam, if you could send us out into, <laughs> distribute us. Thank you. And if there are questions, of course, Put, put them into the chat. Nikki and I can respond to them. Um, just recognizing the question in the chat, that's the link that the video just brought me to. Um, also, some folks are gonna be in groups of four just because of the way that the numbers worked out. Um, but I'll send you all off now. So Sam, is Meg the only one that's still? Yeah, hi Meg. Can you hear me okay? Do you wanna come off mute for a second? Are you here still? <laughs> you are assigned to a breakout room, you just need to click join. But if you don't answer soon, I'm gonna assume that you're not actually there. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam. I'm, my nerves are like. You're, I totally understand. Uh, we've done this so many times now that I'm like, oh, it's so fine. Don't worry. 
I'm, I'm, I'm such a, so typically when I present, I'm a kinesthetic presenter, so I'm normally, you know, you know how some directors of education are deal with mostly administrative, but I'm literally like out and, and, and not to say that others aren't as well. So having to, to adjust to the Zoom sphere has been, as with everyone else, just major. And it's just like, well, how do you not become super animated within your frame? And then how do you get the power of what you're trying to convey just with words when, you know, our art form is very visual and kinesthetic and, you know, it's just, it's just a combination. It's an amalgam of them all. So, um, and that's what we said when we were talking to Kati, just being comfortable enough to, you know, it's some heavy hitters in here. Yeah, I feel that. I don't know. I think if there's anything that this conference, this virtual conference has taught me is that at least at the end of the day, I think that like, like, the like human spirit at least like still comes across so strongly in virtual space you think um, and i know i felt it from facilitators hold on mm -hmm. hello lamb's iphone can you hear me are you supposed to be in a breakout room and can i help oh yeah hi i'm just i'm here to more to listen i'm i'm sorry I'm, um, my name's leanne lamb i'm with contemporary asian theater scene in um california and then um we're doing more online programs, but I'm interested in learning more about um, how to bring education into the mix. Awesome. Um, the group is currently in breakout rooms. I thought before that oh. I tossed you somewhere. Yeah, I think I think I did. I think I did. I, I, I was, yeah, <laughs> I wasn't quite sure how much I, sh I, what is the schedule for the time for breakout? Uh, the breakout is just gonna be, they're each about 10 minutes. We're about, uh, um, it looks like we still have like seven-ish minutes left. Um, so oh. I can send you back to a breakout room if you want to join a conversation. Okay, might as well. <laughs> Thank you. I think you actually may have a button on your screen already to join that says join breakout room. Oh, okay. Room. Okay. Just Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I got that. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> So Sam, you were saying the human spirit, you th that's where we left off? Still just comes across so strongly, you know? Like I think like, I, I think that <laughs> particular, I think it's been such a, a thing, particularly with like all the affinity spaces of color I've been in that people mm -hmm. are like, ah, it's so hard. And I felt it too, cause I'm such a vocal person. So it's weird to be on Zoom and be on mute and all of those pieces. But when people are, are just like facilitating conversation and showing up as they are like, I, I at least still like deeply resonate with people. Um, I feel like I have, like, I feel like I have a sense of your energy in the same way that I would have a sense of your energy in person. Um, I, think, I don't know. I find that to be like so huge and exciting and relevant in a time where we can't physically connect. Uh, uh, thank you for the kind words. Yeah. But I also like, do I hear you? It's like hard. It's very hard to like show up in this space and, and still feel connected. Mm -hmm. when, like everybody has their camera off, all of those things. Sometimes it just like feels like you're talking at a wall and it's like, that's not, that's not what we want, you know? Right. Yep, yep, yep. Also, I, I must say, I didn't know, I didn't realize that you were connected to, I've seen like your name floating around in the TCG ether since I've joined. Right. Didn't realize you were connected to True Colors. Y'all have a banging ass team. Like, oh, what? Thank you, thank you. We're an interesting group. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, thank you. It's been interesting to see what's been happening. I mean, I'm, I'm all, all over, but in Atlanta, um, especially in the um, arts world, they have been. So, um, it would be great to hear a little bit about. Um, what, what some of you were talking about in your, um, in your breakout sessions. If, um, it might be easier to, uh, I'm trying to think, what's the, never mind. I, I thought we could, we could do the raise hand function, but um, I don't think that that's, I think it's. You should be able to if you click oh, participate. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that might the easier thing might be to just say hand raise in the chat and then uh, one of us can support calling on people. Perfect. I might disagree just because it's a lot of people in the room. I think uh, if you 
if folks do know how to use the raise hand function, it automatically cues you. You just click participants and you should see an option too. Yes, it's under uh, participants. Yes. So if folks who uh, were assigned to report out want to use that mm -hmm. function. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I actually don't see it on mine, but. Um, but. Because you're a co host. Oh, okay, never mind. Never mind. Okay. So, so, so somebody want to report out from their group? It looks like Corby raised <laughs> their hand. Thank you. Thanks, Sam, for it's hard for me to see. Um, yeah, in our group, we had we had a really great discussion. We talked about um, how the word universal when describing performances or describing um, books that that sort of catchphrase of like universal human experience is really alienating um, before someone even walks in the door to see something. And so really thinking about our vocabulary and talking with our marketing colleagues about what that vocabulary is, is really important. Because no matter what the work is you're doing in the room, if that's already happened, you've you've sort of shut people out. Um, and then we we talked a lot about building from foundations of knowledge that young people bring into this space and how to do that in like long term classes, but also how we can do that by listening first and really heightening listening in our facilitation skills um, to make sure that that we're coming in as listeners so that individuals, even in a workshop scenario, um, that we can be more culturally responsive to to the young people in the room with us in that space. Awesome. Mallory, I think you're next. Sure, hi. Um, so we talked about, um, we had a split group of like people that come into our institutions and some people that go out into classrooms. And so when you have, with people coming into your institution, large amounts of students, um, how do you find the time, particularly if classes are small, like um, in time, like an hour, 50 minutes, how can you create a space that um, invites this kind of sharing? Um, or if you're going into a room and you're only there for a day or two, how do you quickly create that with a group? Um, and so we, you know, kind of talked about, yeah, just coming in with listening and inviting an intentionality of like, this is the room that we want to create. Um, we talked about um, diversity, not maybe just being in race, but there's a lot of like things that you can't see um, quickly about somebody maybe when you enter a room or they enter the room um, and the things that we assume and trying to fight against that and how to offer points of um, opportunities for students to feel safe to share those um, ways in which we can open that talking up. There are just more a lot of questions than answers in our group. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Felicia, I think you're next. Hi, um, so most of my group um, are were people who of course are sending out teaching artists. Um, I was the big difference in the group because I'm actually a high school teacher. And so um, they asked me to share uh, <laughs> uh, so that you could get a teacher's perspective. And um, my major thing is, is this, talk to the teachers. If you want to know the culture in the classroom, the teachers are the ones there all the time. Um, and I will tell you, and like I told them, um, it's a learning experience for me as a teacher um, that I go through throughout the whole year in learning and understanding my own students and the cultures that they're bringing with them. Um, I, I teach at an urban high school in the capital of New Jersey. And, but I went to a private, private suburban school when I grew up. So very different for me, even in coming into the situation. So I've had to learn about the culture and my partners, which is McCarter Theater and Passage Theater, um, they've been coming into the community much longer than I've been teaching in the community. So they've already built up those connections with the teachers and with the students. Um, but I, the major, major thing is talking with the teachers because the teachers know what's in their classroom. 
um, and can definitely give you the heads up about what you're walking into. Um, and most of the teaching artists who've come into my classroom, we've had those conversations beforehand. Is there something that they should know um, walking into the space? Where are my kids emotionally at that particular time? What's going on with them? So. Thank you. Um, Skip. Sure. Uh, we had a nice chat and, and my colleague Laura will, will smile to find out that we had technical difficulties during the breakout session. <laughs> Um, uh, but the um, uh, one of the things that came up was was well two things I think one is the uh, is the burden that artist educators and educators are taking on as the challenges grow and grow and grow with more and more cultures that we come in contact with uh, and so that led to the second part of it which is and I would love to be a part of this but uh, but the the refreshed uh, and increasing need for uh, for a resource of techniques on how to connect to different cultures to unlock and connect and learn about as you begin the teaching. And it, and it can be accelerated if you only have a small period of time with whichever group that you're with. And uh, uh, I, I love the notion of talking, Felicia, of talking to the teacher ahead of time before you head into the school. That's pretty terrific. Uh, so I think that was the main two things from our group, unless anybody else in my group wants to join in. I feel like that's a no from your group. So we'll go on to Sarah. <laughs> sure. Well, first, thank you. Thank you so much to my group. Um, we had a really lovely conversation. And one of the things that um, started to come up was uh, as we are talking about creating curriculum and, and making uh, connections within our community and, and with different um, organizations and with different cultures within our communities, there is an amount of time that we as educators, time and effort and resources that we are putting forward and recognizing that um, th we are um, wanting to put more time and more effort to make these connections and to make individual connections with our students and not paint them with a broad, a broad brush. And so recognizing that within our organizations as well, there may be misunderstanding as to what that can mean. And where we as educators want to really focus on getting to know um, a, a, certain, um, a certain group within where, where we live, um, that, might not, that might be misunderstood by those who maybe fundraise, um, that our numbers may not be as high because we are focusing our time and our efforts and our hearts in a certain direction. And so it might not be 300, it might be 30, but the work is being done. And so how do we start that conversation within our organizations? And then also thinking about resources of our teaching artists and um, how, do we, how do we make sure that we are training our teaching artists? How do we make sure that we are representing um, our students that we are working with? Um, through our teaching artists and the really thinking about what that means beyond race and ethnicity, but also thinking about the, the having the conversations about values and having the conversations about individualism as well. Did I miss anything, guys? I think that was it. If, if anybody from my group has anything, please, please speak now. Thank you. I wanted, no, I think you did a lovely job, Sarah. Thank you. Um, what I would also just like to add is just, um, I think with uh, what Felicia sh shared earlier, I think I'm, I'm also thinking that as uh, directors of, of programming, we have to make sure that as we are um, so distance and far away from what's happening in, in the ground and uh, boots on the ground, how do we as administrators and program directors continue to stay connected to what's happening in the room? And that sometimes it's really difficult because you know we're one person trying to oversee and manage. Um, and, and so how do, uh, I think one of the things that we um, mentioned is the idea that how do we surround ourselves with the people that are going to help us build those relationships and connections with those communities. And our teachers are, uh, you know, in the classroom are absolutely one aspect of it. Our teaching artists that are working within our institutions are also another aspect. And then what are those other partners in our communities that we're not thinking about that could also uh, help us develop those relationships um, and, and keep us um, engaged 
on how these relationships are shifting in those rooms. Absolutely. Was that everybody with the raised hands? Sam? Uh, oh, oh, no, no, no. They're we're just getting. Okay. I, uh, again, just to name for the group, we had nine breakouts. So there hypothetically should still be, I believe, four more people to speak. If I did my math right. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jillian, would you like to report out? Sure. Um, my group, uh, if I jumped in because my group wasn't speaking and because we were talking until we were shifted in, we did not actually select a human to speak out. So others of my group, Mary, Leah, Stacia, and Courtney, please be prepared. Um, but one of the things that we noticed <laughs> was that, and I didn't really recognize this until listening to everyone else, but the first part of our time, we took finding out who each other were. And that took up quite a bit of time because we were actually very different in that room. And so that is the thing that is hitting me the most is that we need to allow for the time when we're planning to make sure that we're not shoving, figuring out who people are. And this is not a comment on the way that that breakout room happened, but looking at again, like even within our own structures that we need to make sure that we are saying something is important by planning the time for it to be important. And that includes being able to talk to teachers, that includes who our teaching artists are, um, and it also includes talking to our respective companies as well. That's something that came up in our group is that teaching artists and education directors might understand so clearly what we're all capable of, but within our own organization, people on the same management level or on the board might have a completely different idea about what it means to have arts and education. Others from my group? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any, okay. Ariella, it looks like you just raised your hand. Yes, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so we talked about kind of like echoing everyone else and myriad of different things in our group as we also all come from different backgrounds. Um, one of the things we were talking about um, in terms of creating different curriculum is kind of the timeline timeline of it all. And I think, you know, right now with a lot of things going on, we, we all want to engage in this work as quickly as possible. And we were kind of talking about how to do it in a way that, you know, allows for some sense of trial and error. Also, like thinking ahead of, you know, the, the changes that might be undergoing in, you know, teaching virtually versus in person and how that might come into play with engaging in this kind of work in this kind of curriculum. Um, we were also talking about, you know, in order to, to do this work with students and, you know, have them be in a space where they want to share their backgrounds, want to share their histories and perspectives, creating a space where students feel comfortable enough to be vulnerable and, and to share those things. Um, so, you know, on the day to day, something that, that as an individual artist, I try and incorporate is, you know, check ins with students, be it like a, you know, fist of five, let me know where you are one to five or, you know, some moments where it can even be smaller scale, even if it's just a story or a moment from today that kind of gives you an insight to where that student might be at. Um, but again, thinking about, you know, more work we can do to, to incorporate those um, narratives so that's, you know, students feel comfortable sharing. Um, and then also someone else, a fair in my group brought up a good point of, you know, sometimes teachers in spaces are, um, uh, have the responsibility of casting students or casting, you know, artists and how do we do that in a way that is, you know, informed, that is respectful, even though, you know, we're, we're not going to know these students' backgrounds totally or, you know, experiences. So um, thinking about that component of the work as, as we move forward as well. That's it. I don't know if anyone else, please, anyone else in the group, if you want to jump in, jump in. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. I'm not seeing any other hand raises, Katya and Nikki. Um, I'm not sure that every group went, oh, 
first. It, 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 it's okay. So, so one of the things, uh, thank you guys so much for um, sharing and reporting out. We do want to ask um, a few group questions um, before we move to our next step. Um, one of the things that was interesting when Kati and I were planning um, this presentation, initially, um, we made a, well, I made a joke where it almost seemed as if, as if we were dancing because we were delicately trying to structure how do we say this and what do we do this and not wanting to be uncomfortable. And then it was finally like, let's just stop dancing. Let's just stop it and let's just have a candid conversation and just talk about what we need to do to move forward because we're not, in, you know, uh, my dancing shoes are up. So at this point, um, respectfully, we wanna have, uh, we wanna stop dancing and see if we can ask a few questions and, and see if you feel comfortable, of course, answering these. So the first thing is, in your organization, what are you most afraid of in tackling this type of work? In some instances, we've, I've spoken to um, teaching artists before and other organizations where they're saying, I'll give you more of a specific example. So at True Colors, we have a competition called the August Wilson Monologue Competition. Every, um, um, you know, August Wilson was a prolific writer and um, most of his work is um, uh, very, very direct. Um, um, yeah, so sometimes in some of our districts, there is apprehension to approach the work because they're afraid of the use of some of the language that is in the work. So when I've talked to some of um, the um, white instructors, um, they've come to me and they said, Nikki, you know, I, when it comes to dealing sometimes with students of color, I feel intimidated too. In, in my effort to try to connect, I don't want to offend. So I just completely veer away from because I don't want to be offensive. And then, you know, I asked them the question, so what do you do when the, the roles are switched? You know, um, in an effort to provide a holistic educational experience, I mean, how far are you willing to go? So why in that particular instance, are you apprehensive to approach the work the same way that you would in other settings? So I guess in knowing that, my question again to you is, what are you afraid of or apprehensive about approaching this type of work? Sorry, I'm just gonna be transparent. Um, so, uh, Nikki, this is the, the point where we thought we might go back into the breakout groups, but just being, um, I think, Nikki, can you just give me a thumb, what's your feeling about, would you, should we stay in the large group or should we go back into the, um, the breakouts? Well, these are not all going to be, I, I think right now we could stay in this one. Okay, okay sorry, I, just, I wasn't sure if I was missing my cue. Uh-uh. Is there anyone that feels comfortable sharing? Mallory? Yeah. Um, this is going to sound odd. I am happier to have frank conversations with students. Mm -hmm. I feel like I can navigate that well. Like I feel like I can bring, that's a talent of mine. Um, it's when I go into somebody else's room, like a teacher, and especially like a teacher, I worked with a teacher for the past two years that blatantly refuses to recognize pronouns beyond she, her, he, him, and has a student that's preferred pronouns are they. <laughs> it's, that was a fun issue to navigate. Um, or So I'm from Greenville, South Carolina, and that's where I work. Or when I go into a teacher's room and they tell me after Trump is elected that we're not allowed to mention the election, but you can tell that the kids are feeling it. Mm -hmm. And so my fear is how, how to navigate educators into really going into this work when I am an artist being invited into their space. So I don't want to alienate them and I want to use them and I want to, uh, and I do try to ask them the culture of their classrooms before we go in. If, I, if, if it's possible, if they're responsive to that, Felicia, that was such a great suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them, I don't know if they're intentionally blind to some of these things or not, but how to, if they're not going to recognize things that are happening in their classroom, how to navigate that to be able to do this work, because it's still important. I guess that's my biggest fear, because I don't want to alienate them because I'm in their space. But I also feel a big responsibility to if I'm seeing something happening in the room to be honest about that too. Awesome. Seeing Juliet's hand. Yeah, I, um, 
I just wanted to respond to that. And I also just wanted to acknowledge again, listening um, to everybody, how valuable it is like to get outside of our Chicago bubble and think about what's happening, you know, uh, across the country. Um, so that was really interesting to listen to. And um, I just think that, like as white um, women, speaking to other, there are so many white women teaching, um, you know, across the country that, you know, I think we just have to grab onto that responsibility to have those uncomfortable conversations and really, you know, spend some time taking ownership about um, how to move forward and sort of that, that is an engagement that we are able to do as white women. And that's a great place, I think, for us to start. There are so many other places where it's very smart for us to step aside. But, um, you know, from teacher to teacher, um, you know, I think that's just a risk that we must continue to take. And there are so many resources for having those complicated conversations. Um, and, you know, I'm sure we all know what many of those are, but I would just say, like, keep going. Um, awesome. Ara, I can see your head next. Hey, hi. Um, hi, nice to see you all. Um, I think the first thing that came up for me with that question is what you're afraid of. And this kind of came up in our breakout session before uh, is having to have the answers right now. Mm -hmm. um, and like, what is the first step? Like having right now to, to know how to address the situation in, in, in the perfect way um, is, is scary. Um, and then also for me personally, um, I am a teaching artist as well as uh, a, a director in the program. I am one of the leaders of many leaders and I'm looking to my leaders. So it feels like it's being halted by everyone trying to figure out the next steps. Um, because for me personally, I, I feel comfortable uh, as Mallory pointed out, like in the room and how to give that space and things to do, but how do I share that with the people that I work with and, and what resources am I getting from those, uh, from my direct leaders and how I'd like to keep the resources flowing down to help everyone and how to do it quickly and right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Brenna has their hand raised. Also, Katya and Nikki, please feel free to tell me to stop. <laughs> after, after this one. <laughs> hey, all. Thanks. Sorry. I came in after the um, breakout group, so I might not have the full context of what the conversation is. Um, I did have one question for clarification and all the comments I've heard since I've come on. I've heard a lot of mention of quote unquote this work um, and this work quote unquote. And I'm just curious what are we talking about anti-racism, anti-oppression, um, just in the um, in the spirit of not dancing around it. I, I want to make sure that my response is, is specific. I'm, I, I couldn't, I couldn't hear you again. It was going in and out. Could you, could you I apologize. I'm going to, I'm going to turn off my video just in case that helps. Um, I just had a clarifying question when folks are saying quote unquote, doing this work. I wanted to, cl I wanted some clarification of what we're talking about. If that means um, anti-racism, if it means anti-oppression more broadly, or if it means diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, since I came in late to the conversation, I want to make sure that my comments are relevant. Are you want go ahead, Juliet? Oh, sorry. No, I wasn't raising. I, I got to take off that hand. <laughs> <laughs> so are, I, I guess for me, um, are, are you saying for those who have spoken up, are, are you asking the work that they're reference, referencing specifically? Are they talking about anti-racist work or cultural? So would you like to speak to someone specifically? Because uh, not specifically. I'm assuming that we're talking about anti-racism and anti-oppression work, but I didn't hear that articulated. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If that is what we're talking about. Um, I, think, I, I think Bernie came to the call late 
And okay. so she's just looking for the foundation and just the jumping off point is the culturally responsive pedagogy is what we're talking about. So, but I, I turn it back to Nikki um, and Kati to further clarify. I, I think I think for the most part that you did, and I think that it's kind of all encompassing. If if we're to be to be specific, it's all it's, it it all works together or needs to, at least. But specifically in title, we're talking about the role of EDI as well as cult cultural responsive teaching and shifting the dominant the dominant narrative of what it looks like when we're going into these organizations and schools as as well. Um, that whole overall brush uh, I think has um, has been a continuum and I think that I, I think it goes without saying that we just need to stop and make an adjustment and make a shift of sorts so I hope that that was that we were able to answer your your question yes you were and thank you for that work to help to help me clarify um, in response to the question about um, what are we afraid of I think if mm -hmm. I do have a fear it's about generalizing um, and about trying to take a generalized approach to what we can do um, and forgetting. So um, some folks have talked about our positionality as predominantly white women in our fields and we are conditioned to kind of sit in our feelings. Um, we are taught and we are racialized to be nice and to be good and, mm -hmm. you know, to give everybody in the same way and all these things that are actually perpetuating um, oppression and racism very often. Um, so my fear is that we uh, that we step back too far from policy and, and um, practice, and that we don't focus enough on the policies and practices that we can put in place uh, to make sure that we are being um, actively anti-oppression, because if we're not actively anti-oppression, we are probably being oppressive to somebody. Um, so thank you for giving me time, and again, apologies for taking extra time for clarification, mm -hmm. but that was very helpful for me, and hopefully it was helpful for somebody else too. Absolutely. Uh, so, so let me ask this. I know we, we talked about going to breakout rooms, but it almost seems like it'll just be too much of a shift and we can answer the question there. Is that okay with you, Kati and Laurie, for the most part? We could just leave the questions here and the discussion there. Um, sometimes we have had um, teaching artists of color that have expressed before that in their respective institutions that their opinions um, have not mattered unless they were dealing with what was deemed a marginalized group or if they wanted a little insight on how do we connect. I, I guess the question posed is how often are you looking to your teaching artists um, as resources beyond just when dealing with people of color when it comes to creating your curriculum guides or finding the, those parallel themes if you're trying to have a show. Um, I, I guess the short of the question is uh, how often are your teaching artists of color given uh, the role or the responsibility for input when it comes to dealing with um, students. Anyone? Do I need to repeat it or uh, we have a hit Mallory? I feel like I'm talking too much. <laughs> so I was trying to make space for people <laughs> to answer. <laughs> um, so I would say this is um, a few years ago, we had some very active teaching artists of color, particularly we had a, a, a black female teaching artist who was like there and she just went um, to grad school. So I feel a big hole in my program um, without her. Um, and I'm struggling with how to actively recruit black teaching artists and artists of color, which I'm sure is going to be maybe something that we talk about later on in this day. I know that's the mm -hmm. session there. Um, and we've talked about it as a staff that we need to be intentional about hiring more people of color. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I, the one thing I do is anytime I know that we're going to have a class where there are going to be a majority of students of color, like at residency, I mm -hmm. try to put an artist of color in on that class because I don't, I feel like that is essential to the work. I don't want to just send <laughs> in when I can. But um, yeah, I think we need to be a lot more intentional about it in our organization um, so that it's not tokenism, like we have one Black artist that always goes. <laughs> uh, like. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Anne puts it in the chat if you want to put them to say. 
Thanks. I don't know where my hand raise went in the chat. So I, um, but uh, I, I guess one thing that has been a big, just a few years ago, I just kind of um, felt like uh, we had to have a teaching artist of color in every classroom and the teaching artists had to be the experts in their own classrooms. Like they, they had to be the, we brought actually Felicia, to Felicia's point, we brought the classroom teachers into every professional development and all of the teaching artists. And I just like stopped. I just remembered this feedback I got from a mentor a while ago that was like, you're working too hard. You're doing too much. Like um, your job is to bring everyone's voice into the space. And that's also the teacher's job. And so like sort of letting go, uh, there was a release of letting go of like me being the person you know, me, the millage white lady being the person who has all the answers is absurd. And I realized that I was obviously knew it was absurd, but was somehow trying to pretend to have all the answers. <laughs> so, um, and I have to say, uh, they're all, uh, it's really just a, a community of teaching artists. I, I didn't have trouble hire. I thought it was going to be much harder than it was to hire teaching artists um, to I, I, the hardest part is tell, was telling a lot of my white teaching artists I couldn't hire them anymore and I couldn't, be, but that this was really important. And actually they were all amazingly gracious about it and was like, I support this, you're doing the right thing. Um, and I guess I'm only saying this to say that I thought it was going to be harder, but there is a critical mass. I found that a lot of teaching artists were hesitant to uh, be the only teaching artist in the room <laughs> for all the obvious reasons or even a, a, one of a handful but now most of my teaching artists um, are are teaching artists of color or black and I it's been a game changer and having the classroom teachers in the room has also um, thanks Sarah? Um, and I'm not speaking directly about the organization where I am now. I'm, I'm relatively new here um, and we're, we are in a, in a building place. Uh, where I was before was in Houston at Theater Under the Stars. And um, one of the things that we started to talk about as, as an organization, um, but also with our community partners too, was checking in to see with them um, you know, with, with either on the, the, the community engagement side, the, the community partner who I work directly with, well, let's have a conversation about this directly. Let's say, okay, the majority of the people that we are working with are Black or are Latinx. Let's have mm -hmm. frank conversation about do you think that it would be beneficial for us to work with a teaching artist who is representative of the people that we're working with and have them kind of help to guide us in that instead of me making a unilateral decision. Um, and having that back and forth was very helpful. And then again, with the teaching artists, we then also would have the conversation of, this is what you know we have come up with. What's your comfort level? Do you feel like this is something that, you know I, I as the person who, I, I feel like you are a really good fit here. Um, however, if you don't feel like you are, then it's not going to, we're not going to have the outcome that we need. So it ended up being this really lovely um, conversation amongst all of us that we would then come back in and check in. Um, and, you know, it wasn't always successful. It wasn't, you know, um, but the, the, the conversation about, you know, reaching out, well, what, what do you think as we are re reaching out with in working with your students, what do you think would be the most beneficial for them? Um, and then the, for the teaching artist, do you agree? Is this your comfort level as well? Was, was very, very helpful. It took a long time to cultivate though, really long time to cultivate. Okay, Skip. Yes, I'll, I'll just be real quick and brief about it. I, I, I think the thing that we're particularly good at in putting together workshops or teaching or sending teacher, teaching artists to the schools uh, and with our teaching artists is beginning together to develop whatever that plan is. That's how, that's how we do it. Uh, the frustrating part for me, and I'll bet you I can be echoed by everybody here as well is, and this is part of the earlier question about the challenges that we're placing on the teaching artists as well, is the, um, is the inability to, uh, to compensate them for how much work is required to be at the beginning of the process 
all the way through. And that, that's just something that has to change. I think that whoever the teaching artist is has to be in the room to, to, uh, to absorb and to contribute to everything that's going on. So that what then goes into the, what you send into the classroom is fully ready to embrace and to absorb whatever they can find there. And if they're only, if they're only in touchstones along the way, then, then everything becomes out of balance. To, uh, to use the question that you originally asked, which I think was um, uh, uh, about that balance, about how much do we listen before we send out and mm -hmm. how much do we work together to send out. Uh, so I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not saying anything that's gonna surprise anybody else, but man, it's frustrating to ask people to do things for free. That's it. There was another hand, yeah, Catherine. Yeah, my, my comment uh, follows that a little bit because I think in many ways our departments are beginning the work of, of meeting new artists, connecting with new communities in, in so many ways, sometimes that our larger institutions can't. Um, but one of the conversations we're engaging in and with questions, not answers yet, is also about how to make sure that those teaching artists are part of some of our larger conversations, as we review scripts, as we have institutional goals shifting. Um, and so that connects to being able to compensate them for the time that they spend with us, not only within our education department, but within the larger institution, and also making sure that those who are our writers, our performers, um, that, we are, that we are meeting them and incorporating their whole artistic selves um, to the extent that we can support them in our organizations and not only in satellite programs far away from, from the organization. So we are, we are very aware of that questioning work right now um, and there's lots to do. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we're, we're nearing the um, nearing the end of this process. I do want to ask, is there any organization or anyone that's willing to share that they're, what their teaching artist, um, what their professional development looks like? For instance, is there a required EDI training? Do you um, provide um, professional development workshops as far as cultural responsive teaching? Is there anyone that's willing to share what their teaching artist training process looks like? Chris, 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 Chris. Okay. okay, Chris Moses. Um, hey, yeah, at the Alliance um, last year, we started a mandatory anti-bias training for all of our teaching artists. Um, we're developing the part two. It was just a part one, a four-hour training on the, the front end, and then there's a, a much more in-depth one that we're rolling out this fall. Um, but that, that's, that's the one that's mandatory. Then we do all kinds of different professional development around specific um, areas of expertise in the classroom. But the, the anti-bias and allyship is, is the one that we've made mandatory. Awesome. Mallory? So for the past five, five to eight years, I've had the program for about five. We do um, a sociodrama training, a uh, two week, a uh, two week, two day sociodrama training um, with a drama therapist where she makes it clear that we aren't therapists, but there are techniques that we can use in applied theater. Um, so that's been our mandatory training for our teaching artists and different ways to approach difficult topics is sort of how we've coded it. Um, as an institution, uh, we have committed this next year to doing implicit bias and anti-racism training for all of our staff and artists, and then we'll roll it out to the community. So that one's to come and we're working with who is gonna run that for us right now. Um, I'm really excited to add that work on top of what we do though. Awesome. Well, what we <coughs> I want to say before we close that we do have resources as well. I think Kati has some of the books and readings on this on, on the screen as well. Share those. We talked about for white folks who teach and talk about for white folks who teach in, in the hood. Uh, blind spot is another one, and we'll have all of these available for you um, to be able to review as well. Um, there is 
Culturize is another uh, great book. Uh, I think it's Jimmy Casas is the book and White Fragility. Um, there are also books specifically that address cultural responsive pedagogy. Um, Zaretta Hammond has an exceptional book on cultural, cultural responsive teaching as well. So we have all of those and we'll put them in the chat to make sure that you're able to um, see those works um, as well. Um, I thank you for your time. I know that we don't have all of the answers and that's the great thing about this as a community that we can bounce off some ideas and figure out how we can strategize and make things um, better. I know we don't make the decisions at the, at the top, but for the level that we are able to control, you know, being able to provide training for our teaching artists, understanding that there is another way. And as I said, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but in this particular example, we're just trying to find a new way to steer it. Kati, do you have anything else to add before we pass it to Lori? So, echo, echo my thanks to everybody for their thoughtful contributions and for this learning community. Thank you both, uh, Nikki and Kati, um, and, and Sam and Amelia as well, and everybody for your uh, wonderful participation. Um, you know, it's a good start. Um, the resources uh, uh, that Kati and Nikki mentioned, um, I will figure out how to get either the PowerPoint slides or the list from Kati. We are, um, thanks to Amelia, taking notes. We will be sharing the notes and the video from this session with participants at some point as soon as we're ready. And we can share that list of resources at that time as well. Um, so hopefully that, that helps uh, move people forward with some specific tangible learnings and strategies.